talking about disruption, and that's what this brings along, to, um, along with it. It'd be interesting to hear your background. We know you're from the UK, but there's a lot of colorful stuff <laughs> along there. You want to introduce uh, I was a, a betting shop manager when I was 18. I was on a kibbutz when I was 21. Uh, I drove motorbikes around London and then went traveling for the next 15 years. Retrained as a journalist. Um, oh, learned about web, learned about digital. Uh, worked for a games company, worked on the side of PR, worked as a journalist. Went to India in 2008 to get away from it with my wife and five-year-old. Lived on the beach in Goa, became a Bollywood film star, as came well. home 2010 here. As one does. As you do. Leveraging Good shit. on you. Um, well, Monty and I met approximately 30 seconds ago um, face to face, but our first introduction was on Skype. Your status says ever curious. Absolutely. So how's that changed the way you act, the way you discover stuff? I'm, just, I'm, pr I'm proud of my lifestyle, I'm proud of the way that I lived. You know, just been curious about stuff. I've been skint quite a lot, no money, um, but always love life, especially the human life, which seems to be falling away, you know, so I'm a bit of a dinosaur in that respect, you know. But yeah, I mean, it's an amazing time to be curious. You know, yeah, there's so sure. much information that you can acquire, so much you can learn. You know, it's a brilliant time for the curious, I think. So, Monty, you've been in and out of the PR and media industry for a long time. Have you seen a change? Of course you have. What were the biggest changes? Great question. Um, I think the lines between a journalist and a PR person are getting less broad. A lot of financial tech journalists end up working for funds, working for a, for a PR company. Um, what's truth? who's writing for who, who's writing what, what are the stories, how are they delivered, what are the channels, how is it going. It's all a big bit of a mishmash. And I mean, to be honest, I don't really know what's going on. All I know is that it's very different than it was even when I retrained digitally 15 years ago. It's completely changed. And um, I mean, that's obviously quite a strong critique over there. You know, how do we how do we sort of mend the lines? And is the you know is the is the whole concept of PR and journalism still valid? I mean, we're all we all journalists and PR writers in our own way. It's we shape the way things are done. You know, I, th I think it's less less those verticals. It's more about influence and, and stuff like that. You know, if you're a company, if you're an individual, you have to have your own brand. And I think that the brand of a of a journalist is certainly becoming how many Twitter followers do you have? You know, who do you write for? How linked in digitally are you with code in the way that people find you uh, and things like that? I think it's uh, it's an it's an ever accelerating, ever moving thing. I mean, I really thought I knew what I was on about about two years ago, and now I think I probably know fuck all. You know, well, um, it's obviously a very interesting criticism over there. So how do we how do we safeguard the the integrity? I mean, at the end of the day, we talk about the industry, but. We're all talking about people, and you know, people like you and I. And um, sure, personality goes a long way in this in this day and age. I think I think it's different in the in Europe than it is into the in the U.S. In the U.S., there seems to be more integrity. The kind of hacks PR. Uh, I'm sorry, germs. <laughs> I just did it. <laughs> hacks v flax is, is 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 you know there seems to be more respect for a journalist in in the U.K. The amount of times that I've gone out and, and I I'm almost I say that I'm a writer, which I am rather than a journalist because of the perception that someone thinks of a journalist. It's all about the hacking scandals in the UK. I mean, we need journalists. We need to protect the people of, of the world from governments. It's extremely important. But the way that it's changed over the years, it's, you know, it's what's true and what isn't true. You know, who's paying who and what, what's the agenda? It's, it's, um, I hope that it comes back you know, the line, but the line at the moment seems to be pretty blurred. Okay, so, um, so I'm the CEO of a company, and obviously, just like me and many other people out there, um, you know, we all want to get into the news. We all, you know, we all want to be on your column on Forbes and on Mashable and, you know, be in the right places, because you obviously have the opportunity to make or break um, companies like us. So what's your, you know, what's the scoop? What do we have to do to, to get noticed? I think it's kind of weird being a tech journalist in the kind of 2000s, 2010s. It's a little bit like being a music journalist in the 70s. You're right. You know, you do have the power to make or break a band or something like that. And that's a really, really strong responsibility because I'm not a particularly smart person or a clever person. 
to have that amount of, of power thrust upon me allegedly is like I'm ever curious but ever fair and, and ever positive. I don't ever want to write about a company in a negative way. Or unless it was really bad. I mean, they were fucking people over or staff or, or anything like that. You know, that's a different thing. But generally, I think, it, you know, if, if a company's got a good message, uh, a good group of people doing great things, it's not very difficult to turn that kind of water into wine when it comes to uh, channels of writers and, and publications. As long as you have a good product and you believe in it, and the people that represent that product are intelligent and smart and able to get that message across. I mean, as a CEO, that's all you need to do. There are tricks and there are gadgets and there are ways of doing it. Um, but I, I would say the most important thing would be to, to network like crazy. You know, everyone's brand, everyone's power, every company's power or brand is based on a network. Go to events, you know, look at... Uh, there's a really brilliant website called Scan Vine, as in scan and vine from grapes. And what that does is that that gives you a, a list of all the writers and all the publications and how, how influential or how many shares that publication has or how many shares that journalist have. You know, I'm middle, I think, you know what I mean? But it's nice to know that I'm above certain right-wing columnists for The Telegraph. Fuck you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but it's actually quite a useful... Uh, it's, it looks very scruffy and all that stuff, but it's a, it's a very useful way of saying, OK, so I work in the tech health sector, there's the tech health sector. Oh, the New York Times health page is number one there, right? And then there'll be other places like that. And it's really worth spending a day going through that and saying, right, that's the person, that's the person. And when you isolate the journalist or the writer, just go straight to Twitter, straight to LinkedIn, try and start a, a, a conversation, or, or do, you know, do, do go through those channels with the old ways. You know, I represent, I work for, this is what we've got. You know, that hasn't changed. Yeah. You know, the channels have changed. But I'm sure, I mean, your inbox must probably get, what, 100 emails a day of people wanting you to cover their story. How do I get into your inbox, and how do, how do, you, how do I get noticed? <laughs> Careful. Um, I, I think that I, I get rid of 98% of those probably 250 emails. 98%? Yeah, in one go. One is, the, I mean, the fails are anonymous, uh, massive clumps of text, uh, no recognition of what I write about, who I am, no links, uh, arrogance that we're the best. It's quite easy to get rid of 90% of them. The 8% is a bit more, a bit more tricky. And the 8%, I mean, to be honest, would be the wrong font. You know what I mean? Wrong font. The wrong font. Well, there you go. If you're doing aerial, forget it. Never That's get my attention. Um, but out of those 2%, I mean, it's generally the same criteria that I just explained. You know, if you've got a good company, good people, uh, a good product, so that's going to get through. And, and I'm a writer. I'm an insecure motherfucker. You know what I mean? If someone says, hi, Monty, I've read your pieces on Mashable and Wired and TechCrunch. Really like that piece that you wrote about uh, wheels being reinvented. We've reinvented the wheel. Bang. I mean, like a, straight away, I'm like that, you know. So never underestimate the insecurity of a journalist. So your suggestion would be for us to hang outside and just um, catch you by the bar drinking and probably sort of just having a chat. Yeah, Brilliant. Another thing from, from that aspect, if anyone does want to talk, I know four or five really, really good PR companies, no commercial relationship, obviously, that do this stuff really well. You know, you it's, it's not that difficult, really. Monty, you're probably one of the best travel journalists around at the moment. You cover stuff from Scandinavia, you were in Africa, you were covering some stuff about... Um, Cognitive and AI and virtual reality, and I, I read a piece. Hey, taking notes. Read a piece that you had in Forbes um, a couple of weeks ago about Bjork and virtual reality. So, what's the scoop about that? Do you think is this where the sort of future is going? Uh, I, I was uh, lucky enough to be a judge at South by Southwest in Austin. Uh, the VR virtual reality accelerator day. So I saw, you know, it was a bit of a kind of dragon's den challenge. If you're aware of that format, where they talk for two minutes and then some judges. Uh, discuss their business and then so I saw the best I suppose of, of that over the course of uh, a morning and an afternoon a lot of its hype and a lot of its nonsense and we saw all that stuff of Google Glass and things like that but I don't think it's going to go away and I think it's kind of evolution or it's kind of foundation in the games industry proves that it does work 
Um, there'd probably be about three or four companies that I saw at South by Southwest which were amazing. One that was super amazing called itself the Snapchat of VR, which I thought was very trendy. Uh, I can't remember what they called. I should remember that. Um, I think it, well, you know, it's, every year is going to be the year of VR and every year is going to be the year of this and all that stuff. It's like everything else, the expectations are raised so high mm -hmm. that you expect it to, to happen and then it does happen, but it happens probably five or six years later. So it's not going to go away. I mean, Bjork's just amazing, you know, and for someone like that to, to almost spearhead that uh, revolution, she is, she's almost VR's written on her forehead, you know, when she left the sugar cubes and went, you know, independent. I saw Bjork when she was, yeah, years ago. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, I can imagine. And I mean, she's definitely one of the people who obviously take on the latest, um, you know, trends that are coming along. And there's obviously stuff as well in immersive learning. And, um, you know, again, coming back in, so you covered a piece about um, learning using AI. There's an interesting company in the UK called, God, I can't remember, I think I spelt it wrong in the piece anyway, Immerse or immer Immersive Technologies which is basically conference uh, tech attainment uh, way of learning via VR, which, I mean, freaks me out a bit, thinking about that, you know? I don't know, I'm not sure. But it seems to be making ground everywhere, you know? What, what scares you most? I mean, you said it's freaking you out. And a lot of us talk today about getting chipped and not getting chipped and about AI, virtual reality. What scares you about the future? What scares you about well, I was the big to stuff? Totally analog until when I came back from those 20 years of traveling, so I was, I wrote poems saying lines of dead computers, you know, I can't wait and all that stuff. But then I kind of embraced it. And I was, and I have a kid, you know, he's 13, and I recognize his behavior, which is not amazingly brilliant for, for me or my wife, you know. So you have to join along. I, I was really optimistic about it until a couple of years ago. Uh, and I'm a little bit scared by it now, you know. The, the idea of, in a virtual reality world, making decisions, brain, don't know, always on the screens, which is a bit of a cliche, but you know, don't know, I'm not, I'm not too happy about the future, yeah. to be honest. Well, the future is obviously going to be Brexit. still about people, I suppose. Well, Brexit makes it worse. I mean, there's no point in being worried about the fucking AI when you've got people like that in my country, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, the, they're the problem. So if you're planning to move, and maybe Malta is one of the right places for you to, to stay here. Well, I came here to get a passport anyway, so if anyone... <laughs> I'm sure there are a number of people who can sort you out um, that way. Okay, jumping back into Malta, and you've been around, you've been to a lot of different um, you know, areas and a lot of different countries where obviously conferences like this are happening all over the place. What do you see in Malta? What do you see that can make the change? And do you actually see that there's you know, huge potential here and what can we do about it? Well, I'll be frank, I've never been to Malta before. I've traveled most of the world. It's a fail on my, on my, on my part. I think there's a perception in my country anyway, that Malta is a bit dodgy and maybe the tax laws are a bit open and all that stuff and I apologise with all due respect. But I do think that is shared by a lot of people. Um, and the gambling hub is another thing that I think people think about. Um, but what I've, what I've seen since I've been here, I've been here for 12 hours. I mean, it's not Dubai, right, you know, as a hub. Uh, and it's not, it seems like the startup ecosystem is a bit stunted. I've heard that education is good. I've heard that talent is good. You've got great climate, good airport. You know, all of those things make a tech hub. Um, I just maybe think that people don't know enough about it. And, and you need, I mean, if you, even if you look at London, London has failed as a kind of tech hub because there haven't been that many exits. Even, you know, New York's come back as an advertising hub, you know, Yahoo, the exit of that. Whole of Silicon Valley is, is a collection of exits where the money's replowed back into the, into the inf infrastructure and into the ecosystem. So I would say you probably need a bit of a star in Malta. You need a great start up. I think you need, I definitely think you need accelerators and incubators or, or, or different forms of business platforms to get this going. I know that Microsoft do some stuff and I've been reading up on it this morning, you know. But to, to create that kind of infrastructure, you know, it, it, it takes time, you know, and maybe it needs that, maybe the whole point of an accelerator is to accelerate things, but maybe, maybe a decent accelerator would help. Yeah. And I mean, based on, on other countries that you've visited, I mean, what are, what are the, uh, the learnings that we can take and which are the sort of, you know, the countries of, of what do you mean? Of, in terms of, you know, choosing a country as an example, which we can base, 
a lot of what we're doing into. There's a question. Um, I mean, you've got Israel, you know, obviously across the Med that's doing some amazing stuff. Maybe uh, it's quite, I don't, I don't want to go into politics about it, but, you know, I went to Ramallah in Palestine, and you know, a couple of years ago and saw their startups scene that operates on 1G and then there's a big wall and then there's 4G on the other side of the wall. So I'm not so sure that that's, that's as fair as it should be. But there's no doubt that there are exits in Israel and there's no doubt that there's an extreme amount of talent there, you know. So, the, the, you know, and, it, and it's a little bit of about a, a branding thing. You know, Israel's been very clever in branding itself as the startup nation. Uh, the anti-European Union leaving in my country was branded as Brexit. So Brexit was a thing, you know, and I think that probably swayed the balance because it was branded in that way. Um, I don't know, I, you know, they're, they're, they're sprouting up everywhere, right? Tech hubs, if you, if, you, if, you, if you run a city and you're not a tech hub, I mean, what are you? You know what I mean? I went to Detroit a couple of years ago and you'd be surprised about how much Detroit has become a hub because cheap rents and people moving out of Silicon Valley and all of these stories about it being a fucked up city is untrue, you know, there's all types of stuff going on downtown. I suppose you just need to have an idea and, and, and have a, you know, I mean, you've got sun, you've got, you know, proximity. I think maybe that's what it is. Proximity to MENA, Middle East, North African companies. If you, if you can imagine that Dubai rises continually because it's a hub between India and Europe. If you could, you know, and, and the same even in Africa, like the Horn of Africa, Djibouti, trying to brand itself as a hub between Ethiopia and East Africa and Europe. If you brand Malta as a, as a hub between here and, you know, Turkey and further south, so maybe that makes a geographical thing. And you should never underestimate the, the amount of money that's in the MENA regions. You know, there's an extraordinary amount of money there, you know, with great ARPU and great innovation as well. All right. Um, thanks, Monty. So clearly there's a lot of talent around here, and we're obviously, um, you know, very interested in seeing what's going to happen with that. I know a couple of good branding companies who could probably help Malta with a bit of branding work. And um, if you want to catch up with Monty, you know where to find him. Simon, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.